of an infectious diseases physician from the US, but is currently based in the, between the UK and Uganda. Um, she's heading the clinical and veterinary services pillar of the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine's uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Center. And she's one of the co-investigators and study coordinator uh, for the FIABLIS study. So I'll let her take that away and tell us more about the FIABLIS study. Good afternoon, and I would just say thank you very much, like others have said, to the Fondation for organizing this meeting. I think it's a fantastic idea to try to harmonize approaches on such an important topic. Um, I won't go into too much more about my own background because you have the bio and I've got an introduction, but I will just say that a lot of the work that I've done has been in Uganda. I've lived there for more than 10 years, and so I'm sorry I have a bit of an Africa focus, but I try to make it apply to everybody. I will also just say that I thank very much our many colleagues who are listening to English as their second, third, or fourth language. So I'm trying to make my American accent as clear as possible, and please feel free to say if you don't understand or if you have some questions about any of the jargon. So I, I have almost completely remade my presentation since this morning <laughs> because I realized that I had um, included a lot of things that other people already made very good discussions of. So excuse me, the my slides are not all beautiful, but I hope they bring us to some newer concepts. I was going to give an overview of studies to date. I think that's already been done so well. I'm not going to repeat that. So I want to focus instead on some issues about study design for fever studies, since we're trying to talk about harmonized study design, and then give you a little bit of an update on our fiebre study that you've heard a bit about. This is the topic outline. And I just want us to keep in mind as we're talking about some other things before we get to it, the study design considerations. There are many. We have spent weeks and even months on our own study design. Lots of you have also spent time thinking about this. Some things that I want to bring out that may sometimes get a little bit seem simple but aren't so simple. The definition of fever, standard clinical case definitions versus novel diagnostics. How do you detect your pathogens? How do you diagnose fever or the cause of fever? At which level of the healthcare system would you like to be working? What are the rationale for including inpatients versus outpatients, different levels of the healthcare system? How do you link your pathogens or your diagnoses back to symptoms and signs and risk factors that you might then apply in a more prospective way in the future? Uh, how should you think about sample size estimates? There's a lot of things to consider there. The, I'm not a mathematician. This is just concepts. Uh, value of control participants. I think we've had that alluded to earlier today. I want to bring that out. I think it's important to at least consider. And, and then a few other considerations. So I'm just going to mention, several of you are aware of this, but I just want to, to, to mention again. This is our non-malaria fever mapping exercise, and this has been... Uh, a labor of love on the part of many of the people whose uh, logos you see there on the left. And this is an example of a screenshot. And uh, Sabina has been involved in this, and we hope that we're going to publish on this very soon. But some years ago, those of us who were interested in fever and non-malaria fever said, my goodness, there's, no, there's not much data, and also there's no funding. We can't get anybody to pay us to do these studies. So what can we learn from what's already been done? And the goal was to optimize availability and use of existing data on what we were calling at the time NMFI, non-malaria febrile illness. And the approach was a systematic review for all malaria endemic geog geographic regions. That's sub-Saharan Africa. Actually, we just went for the whole continent of Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America. This involved a systematic review of more than 100,000 published studies. A lot of um, junior colleagues spent a lot of weeks and months of their lives on this. Uh, we compiled the results into a database. There's some very nice data guys at the University of Oxford now working with the EDO group. And um, the database supports an interactive and updatable map. So I'm not supposed to give you the full URL just yet because it's not ready for prime time, but it will be there hopefully very soon. And you can see that you can hover over the pins and pop out little data. So we're hoping that work that you do can also then be fed into this system because it's, a, it's meant to be an ongoing clearinghouse. So if you look at those 100,000 uh, publications, <coughs> You can see it, what, it, what it helps you do is not really say what is going on, but it helps you identify the gaps. And you might say that's a lot of work to have gone to just to identify gaps. 
that we thought, if nothing else, this can help us to determine priorities for research, surveillance, prevention efforts, research and development for new point of care diagnostics. And some things that we've already noticed as a result of this, this may not surprise some of you, some people seem to be more surprised by this. For example, a lot of things that we don't recognize or think of in Africa in clinical care are actually present. For example, meliodosis, very, very dangerous pathogen, soil-based bacteria recognized in Asia, but not much in Africa. Also, the dengue virus, again, not something that comes up on most clinicians' radar when they're thinking about how to manage their febrile patient. Another example, um, lots of findings of Klebsiella, just a, a very typical gram-negative bacteri bacteria. But this is actually a quite common cause of neonatal sepsis when people go looking for it. And that's a bit concerning because what's the first line treatment for, for neonates? I'm not a pediatrician, I'm an adult clinician, but what's the first line treatment for neonates in many of these parts of the world? It's amoxicillin, amoxicillin plus minus gentamicin. And Klebsiella species are just intrinsically resistant to amox. So just some considerations that can highlight to kind of give us directions for new research. Obviously, some of the limitations of this is that it's only the presence of infections, it's not prevalence data, and the absence of data don't mean the absence of infection or the absence of the pathogen. And also, it's quite heterogeneous. You might say in a sort of a negative way, garbage in, garbage out, or you might say that this just means we need better quality studies. Okay, and I'm not going to go over all of these because I think we've touched on many of these things. I'll just highlight there was a very nice series in clinical microbiology and infection in 2018. There were publications on fever studies in Africa, fever studies in Asia, I believe also Latin America, and many of the people that a lot of us uh, respect very much and are working with in different forums, um, Paul Newton, Kike Bassat, John Crump, and other colleagues were involved in these. So I just highlight them. You can read them at your leisure. And some nice, uh, some nice conclusions and nice overviews. Okay, so if we look at all of this, and some of you have already made these points very, very well this morning, some broad conclusions that we can draw from the available fever etiology data in 2018, 2019. Many, but not all, fevers are due to treatable or preventable infections. That's part of the problem, actually. A variable proportion are due to self-resolving causes. The epidemiology of the most common infectious causes varies dramatically across time and space. Some categories are under-considered and under-treated, for example, those that can be treated with doxycycline as opposed to beta-lactam antibiotics. And the challenge for many infections is that we can't, uh, we, we need more information to be able to distinguish the causative pathogen from just carriage or historical exposure. And we've tried to address many of these issues in our design of the Fiebre study which I'm going to tell you about. So now let's move on to sort of a, a laundry list of study design considerations that I think we might want to keep in mind as we're developing new protocols or discussing new projects. This is the same list that I went through earlier, just to remind us. So definitions. And this seems very basic. It seems like we should know what's a fever and what's not. It's actually quite complex. There's the biomedical definition. That's what you get if you measure by sticking a thermometer in somebody's tongue or ear or under their arm or in their rectum. Uh, biomedical definition is usually an elevated body temperature of somewhere around 37.5 to 38.3. There's no such thing as a normal body temperature, is there? There's, kids have different temperatures over the course of the day. All of our temperatures vary. Menstruating women, our, our uh, normal body temperatures fluctuate over the course of the month. So there's lots of different things that go into this. You can't say, here's the threshold. Anybody above this has a fever. Anybody below doesn't. But in general, these are the thresholds. That's a centigrade and Fahrenheit. Depends also on the method of measurement and the clinical scenario. So already one level of complexity that we need to have in mind. Number two, of course, fever can be due to infectious causes. That's what most of us in this room are thinking about when we're here at this meeting. But of course, they can also occur as a result of non-infectious causes. It's just your body's reaction to something, isn't it, a fever. Can be cancer, rheumatological conditions, drug reactions, deep vein thromboses, other things. So a lot of these are not on our radar. We're concerned about inf infectious causes, but just we can keep in mind that there's other things that are not even infectious that can cause the same syndromes. And then I feel embarrassed to just have this be one bullet point on one slide, but there's a huge body of literature on fever in the medical anthropology and social science uh, research. Just as a small example, our colleague Vinay Kamat a few years ago made a, it was a very nice article 
just on local illness classifications and care seeking for febrile illness mediated by social factors, cultural meanings of fever, perceived severity and past experience, structural disadvantages that affect access, patterns of communication between patients and caretakers and healthcare providers. Some of our social science colleagues have just been recently doing some work in Uganda. I've lived in Uganda for more than 10 years. I think I know something about how Ugandans think about fever, but they're still telling me things that are very new. Adults have feeling hot with a knot in your stomach. That's one direction. That's one thing that you should think about for diagnosis. There's feeling hot and having waist pain. What is waist pain? But this is a syndrome that people are thinking of. This is something that people are experiencing that drives them to seek one type of care versus another. And I think we're just scratching the surface on that. So I just want to also point people toward articles by our wonderful colleague at uh, London School, Claire Chandler, has written a lot on this, and I think a number of you might already be in touch with her. Anyway, there, there's more than just a, one group that's uh, available to do this, but we can't, um, we can't do good clinical and laboratory and epidemiological work on this topic without knowing something about local perceptions and how people are seeking care and how people are thinking about diagnosis and treatment. So I just want to highlight that as well. Whoops, what did I do? I'm sorry, it won't, it won't change slides for me? I think I touched something wrong. Okay, thank you. So maybe just to try to summarize this a little bit or simplify it, the definition of fever for study purposes, we can think about this as subjective, which is the reported fever. I feel hot, I come seeking care because I feel hot or the patient feels hot versus objective. Do we care what the body temperature is or do we care what somebody's care-seeking behavior is on the basis of that? So of course, um, subjective symptoms may relate to care-seeking, self-treatment, perceptions of appropriate care. And I think we all know this intuitively, but maybe it's helpful to try to think about it when it comes to defining our selection criteria for our studies. And again, uh, item C, fever symptoms often differ in children versus adults. In our fiebre study, we've actually had to change midstream our selection criteria, which is obviously not something you'd like to do in the middle of a clinical study, because in Zimbabwe, for example, adults don't come saying, I feel hot. They have a high temperature, but they don't come saying, my body feels hot. They bring their kids in because their, their kids feel hot, and the kids have a high temperature. But the way um, adults, and you may think about this as an adult yourself, you may think about your own experience of illness. I think this is fairly intuitive now, but we had to change, I'll bring this up when I show you our selection criteria, we had to actually change in midstream. So there may be some differences in how children versus adults um, experience fever. Is this making sense so far? And then let's talk about level of health care. So why would you want to study fever in inpatients versus outpatients? In my mind, the goal of inpatient diagnosis, so this is people with more severe illness, triage isn't always perfect, especially in a lot of the settings where we're working, but we can maybe roughly estimate that the inpatients are more severely ill. Here the goal, I think, is to improve targeting of antimicrobials and supportive therapies and to improve the outcomes. People die when they come with fever and get admitted. We want to prevent them from dying. We want to send them home healthy so that they can get better. You may also then think roughly of the goal of outpatient diagnosis. This is probably responsible for a huge amount of the overuse or inappropriate use, all of these non-politically correct terms that we use, um, of overuse of antimicrobials. And we would like here to safely reduce the overuse or inappropriate use of antimicrobials and then improve clinical outcomes as well. So maybe just a little bit different goals that might also shape your sample size thinking when you're designing a study. Obviously, also, we've already heard very, very nicely about different levels of the healthcare system in terms of hospital versus healthcare, health center versus community. So I won't go into that in much more detail, but I would just point out, I'm not sure this is obvious to everybody, but in low and middle income contexts or countries, I think there's a tremendous variety in the capacity that's personnel, lab, training, and so forth in different settings. And I think my observation is it's very easy to sit in a nice conference room in London or Tokyo or San Francisco and think that people are much more sophisticated than maybe they actually are. I'm not saying people aren't intelligent. I'm saying they don't have training and they haven't got the support that they need to diagnose and manage at a more sophisticated level. This is my observation. You may not agree with me. But I think that we want to try to keep things maybe a little more on the... On the on the simpler side for a lot of these contexts you can discuss. 
This is just uh, this is a health center four, which is at the higher level of healthcare in Uganda on the western border. And this is the laboratory. And I don't even know if you can make it out because the tree is so dominating in the photograph. But there are several dozen people sitting outside that laboratory waiting for evaluation. So if this is what you're confronting every morning as a healthcare worker, how much time do you have? How much time do you have to really think things through? And I just want us to remember a little bit about the caseload and the patient load and the, the huge workload that a lot of the healthcare workers are dealing with in these contexts. Which leads me to case definitions. So for the Fiebre study, we thought very hard and we said that we want to focus on internationally accepted standard clinical and lab definitions. We were actually, I, I hope David doesn't mind if I mention this, but we were initially, our study was supposed to be funded by DFID and Wellcome Trust. And Wellcome Trust said, this is not rocket science, this is not very sophisticated, we're not interested, we're not funding it. And we said, we know there's no basic information, but this may, this may affect your sample size as well. So we're not doing next generation sequencing, we're not doing a lot of novel targeting um, new diagnostics, we're trying to use standard case definitions. And this usually, as we've already heard alluded to, uh, involves some assessment of the clinical syndrome and then some diagnostic assays, not just presence of the pathogen, but considering it in context. And this actually can get kind of complicated. So just as one example, brucellosis, which is an important zoonosis that we find in a lot of, uh, a lot of parts of Africa, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere, this is the current CDC case definition. This continues on to the next page, by the way, or the next screen. So if we're just thinking about the laboratory criteria for diagnosis for this one important pathogen, the definitive diagnosis is culture and identification of the organism itself, the bacterium itself, or a fourfold rise or greater in the antibody titer between acute and convalescent phase serum, and those are supposed to be done more than two weeks apart. So that's definitive. There's also a presumptive, and that's the titer change by a greater than 160 in just a single sample after symptoms, or detection of the DNA in a clinical specimen. So this is the laboratory basis. And then this is the case classification. So you have a human being with probable brucella infection if they've got those lab diagnostics and a clinically compatible illness with those features. We won't go into them in great detail. Probable and also confirmed then. So clinically compatible illness with definitive lab evidence of brucella infection. So if you're thinking about diagnosing and, and saying what's, what proportion of your patient population has brucellosis, this is the kind of background you need to think about. So just in terms of figuring out how we're designing our studies, again, I bring this up as an example of how it can be quite complex to think about what, what, what diagnostic tests you're using and, and definitions you're using. And I think it would make the point that from a conceptual and even logistics perspective, the pathogen detection is relatively simple. It needs fancy technology, it needs some money, but that's pretty easy. But actually figuring out what proportion of your patients or what, what, what's the clinical case definition, I think for a lot of us that's the most relevant thing if we're thinking about how to uh, reduce morbidity and mortality and how to treat appropriately. If you're just doing surveillance, you may have different goals, but I think for our fever studies, this is one of the things we're interested in. So then how do we link all this to symptoms and signs and risk factors? And so now I'm thinking back to that picture we saw a few slides ago with the very heavy patient load, tons of people sitting outside a laboratory, outside a clinic waiting to be seen and evaluated. And I think ideally, especially those of us who are infectious disease physicians, we love taking a very, history, a very thorough history and physical exam. We insist that our medical students do this. This is part of infectious disease medicine. This is just not feasible in a lot of the settings where we're trying to work. It's not feasible for reasons of workload, for reasons of training, sophistication, and so forth. And I think we've actually had a huge amount of debate about this in the Fiebre study in terms of even how detailed do we make our case record form? How many things do you ask for? Do people even, can people accurately report the duration of their fever? Not as often as you might like to think. So I think we run the risk of overtaxing our clinical staff or even just overtaxing our research staff if we design things that are too complex and too sophisticated. And I would just recall those of us that came from a malaria background know very well that in the 1990s there were a lot of very nice and thoughtful attempts to improve malaria diagnosis just with signs and symptoms, just on the basis of algorithms. Daniel Chandramohan, Christine Luxemburger, um, there were, there were several very nice publications back in the 1990s before we had decent malaria point of care tests when people were trying to improve just on the basis of Palmer Powler or anemia, you know, signs and symptoms of anemia. You can't do it. There's no good, there's, 
if we, could, if we could do this without blood tests or without some type of diagnostic test, we would know it already. So I think there's a limited amount to be gained by trying to add more clinical history and physical. I'm not saying there's nothing to be gained, but I think we need to think carefully about how much we load onto the research staff and the clinical, the clinical staff when we're thinking about how much of this is relevant and useful. We have considered in FIEBRE that it is worthwhile to try to include specific risk factors for severity scores, I'm sorry, risk factors and severity scores. Risk factors in Southeast Asia, for example, it may be very relevant that an adult man has been for the last two weeks working in the forest because that gives him different exposures than if he's been working in the rice fields or going to an office job. So something like that, probably exposure history. And then there's the severity scores that some of you who are clinicians will know well. LODS, uh, what is that? Lambarene, Lambarene, what's the O stand for? There you go, thank you. That's for, the, that's for pediatrics. And the Q-SOFA is a simplified severity score for bigger people. And I'm not sure this is published yet, recent, yet or not, but I think some of our colleagues from Malawi have recently found that for, for grown people or for older children, the ability to stand up by yourself is actually very predictive of, your, of, your, of the severity of your illness. So even something quite simple can, be, uh, can have clinical relevance. We turn to the basis for sample size estimates. So I think we can accept that the, any single pathogen, dengue itself or brucellosis itself, any single pathogen or etiology is likely to be quite rare in a given study population or environment. And this is just cut from our Fiebre protocol. I just show you, for example, 600 patients per group gives you this type of, um, does that mean my time is up? Ha, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know what to do. Um, <laughs> I will say that an alternative to calculating your sample size on the basis of the pathogen group could be, I think as Valerie and others already alluded to this morning, to calculate on the basis of treatment groups. So really what you probably care about is supportive treatment only, beta-lactam antibiotic, or a doxycycline antibiotic. And if you just want to categorize by that, it gives you much more manageable sample size calculations. The value of control participants so here, there's two reasons to include community controls. And I hope, do people understand what I mean by community control? Somebody who's not sick, who's not presenting for care. So you've got your study population, for, for example, in Fiebre, folks that have, fe have fever and have come seeking care. And then this is community controls, just people who are out, not seeking care, not having any particular symptoms. Why do you care what's going on with them? For two reasons, number one, in order to estimate attributable fractions for your ill population, for your treatment-seeking population, you need to know the background prevalence of infection or colonization with that same bug in, um, in other members of the community. For example, if you're swabbing people's pharynxes, you can find all sorts of stuff in the back of your oropharynx or nasopharynx, but how do we know it's actually causing symptoms? We need to know what the prevalence is in the healthy or well population and compare that to what it is in our patients. Serologies, of course, we need to know something about the background prevalence of uh, antibody titers. And then also to estimate incidence, which we can also use to feed into calculations of burden of disease, which is not described for most of the etiologies we're interested in. Uh, we are doing, this is, you can find this published as well, healthcare utilization survey on fever episodes and treatment seeking in the community. That helps you figure out what proportion of people with fever are showing up at your health facility or in your study population as opposed to anywhere else that they might have access to. Just a few other considerations. I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, children or adults, the etiologies of fever are quite different depending on the age range of the patient of the population. Uh, some, I want to just emphasize again what I think is the very, the great importance of qualitative work, some social science to better understand local perceptions of fever, care-seeking, prescribing practices. Um, Yoel and others may talk more about this in a little bit, but the inclusion of biomarkers, host immunity biomarkers, to help distinguish bacterial from viral or other infection, predict severity and pro prognosticate. Omics, this is a big kind of grab bag of fancy lab techniques, but genomics, transcriptomics, proteinomics, differently expressed genes or proteins in the host, in the patient, with different infections. And so this is some very early fields, but there may be something that could develop into point of care or diagnostic tests in a few years if we understand better some of the markers that we could pick up on earlier in the, in the process of an infection. <coughs> 
And then I just mentioned the value of trying to get a sample archive if you're collecting biological samples, whether that's nasopharyngeal swabs or blood, to test um, in, in the future if you, if you manage to get a bit extra and don't use it all up in your study. All right, I was going to go on to fiebre, but I think maybe I shut up. Yeah? Yeah, and I don't want to take up other people's time. Um. Yeah, and I didn't, I think um, the, the topic has evolved since this morning. <laughs> so, okay, we'll just try to do a little bit. This is the website. We are trying to be as transparent as possible with our protocol. We're updating our SOPs. Those are going to be publicly announced to you. So you want to read more about it, it's on the website, or I'm happy to send you a copy. We share our protocol with anybody who asks because we very much support the idea of having harmonized approaches on this topic. That's a cool deconstructed RDT that our, our colleague Chrissy Roberts made. Sorry, the, the icon, the logo. Okay. Fiebre study has been running since mid-2018, and it's got funding, and we plan to keep going until 2021, although that's the total study activities, not the actual collection of data. And it stands for, in Spanish, febrile illness evaluation in a broad range of endemicities. Some of you will recognize that fiebre means fever in Spanish. Um, these are countries that in that nice publication on the lower right were found by our colleague John Crump's graduate student not to have an appropriate study, and that's actually most of the study area, most of Southeast Asia and Africa do not have a study that would answer your questions on fever etiology. The green dots are study sites. Myanmar we've recently lost, as some of you know. I'll tell you more about that. And the orange dots are different reference laboratories, so you can see it's a very international study. Uh, we heard a little bit this morning about the need to think about malaria prevalence and HIV prevalence. You might say, wow, those are, our study sites look like they're really all clustered together, clumped together. In fact, there's a huge variety in terms of malaria transmission uh, tr intensity. I won't go through all those, but you can see that there's very high to very low malaria transmission, malaria endemicity. This is HIV prevalence. We have no idea what it is in kids, but it's shockingly high, up 40% in Mozambique. I can't even stand it. We need to do something about that. And then lower in the other African settings and quite low, as far as we know, in the Asian settings. So lots of underlying uh, variety. These are the specific primary objectives. I'll just try to highlight a few main points. We're looking for treatable and or preventable infections. We're not looking for everything. We tried to find a, a reasonable list of things that we think are either preventable or treatable that we're, we're diagnosing. We're looking in outpatients and inpatients. We're looking across the age range, and we're trying to look at how fever etiology varies by these different um, pa patient and geographic um, characteristics. We're also trying to look at antimicrobial resistance where we identify a bacterium, maybe also a fungus. We're, going, we're doing susceptibility testing. These are our secondary objectives. We're also trying to do what I mentioned before. We're looking for incidence, not just presence, but incidence of infection by using a healthcare utilization survey. We're building an archive. We're saving a lot of samples. This is very logistically challenging, but they should be available to other academic researchers, diagnostics developers, and others to do answer more questions after the current study is, is finished. Excuse me. We are evaluating some biomarkers that Yola can tell you even more about, and Kevin Kane, because they're very involved in this part of the study. And we're looking, in general, this is sort of the end result. We would like to be able to generate some data that can inform the development of new fever case management algorithms like IMCI, like IMAI, like other things that we can update, which is actually the real, it's, it's very challenging from an analytical standpoint. We'd be happy for some advice and discussion on that. Methods, again, outpatient inpatients two months and older, so we're not capturing the neonates, but we're capturing everybody else. In Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, we'd be happy to enroll more, recruit more sites if we get more funding. We are currently operational in Laos. That's been going since October, Malawi since uh, July. Mozambique since December, and Zimbabwe since June. We unfortunately lost Myanmar after a protracted wrangle with the ethics committee there. We were very disappointed to lose access to that site. So we're currently in the process of trying to identify an alternative fifth and possibly sixth site. Studies running for 12 months at each site, at least 12 months to capture seasonal variation. This is a breakdown of the sample size based somewhat on that table I showed you earlier. This is 2,400 patients at each site, 
and that's half outpatients, half inpatients, half kids under 15, half people 15 and over. So we try to capture some cross-section of the, of the age ranges. This is what I mentioned earlier. We've actually had to change our selection criteria midstream. So when we first started the study, we included reported fever, presenting with a history of subjective fever. <coughs> We found that that did not work. We weren't getting enough because people report, people seem to experience and report fever very differently across sites. I can give you more details because it was not the same at any two sites. We had to knock that out so that we could improve our recruitment. We added axillary. We were just starting with tympanic temperature measurements. We added axillary so we could have more of the health facility staff helping us recruit. We want you to not have been hospitalized or having undergone surgery in the previous month because we don't want healthcare acquired infections. We want community acquired infections. Two months and older, as I said, outpatients only, we are restricting to residents within a defined catchment area so that we can match you with a community control for the other purposes of doing controls. Outpatients only in kids. We started with this in adults as well, but we, we, now we're only in kids. We are insisting that you not have symptoms of diarrheal diseases. We did not want to reproduce the GEMS study. We don't want to do another diarrhea study. We think we have some decent data on that. We also tried to res restrict um, respiratory infections because we didn't want to overrepresent respiratory infections. Of course, they're very common in kids. We also didn't want to redo the PERCH study, pneumonia etiology study. It turned out to be very challenging because as those of you who are parents or pediatricians know, kids breathe fast when they get hot. And that's really the only way that we could figure out without benefit of radiology. That was the only way we could try to restrict um, respiratory infections. So now the only restriction for symptom syndrome is diarrheal diseases in kids, and that's uh, more than three loose stools in a 24-hour period. You need to be able to participate both on day zero and give samples and on day 28 for clinical outcome and also uh, convalescent uh, serum for serology. And then, of course, written informed consent for everyone in ascent for the older kids. Uh, just very briefly, I think that these slides will be available, and again, like I said, the, pr the protocol is available. We're doing a targeted illness and, history expo and, and exposure history, doing a focused physical exam. Again, lots of debate about what to include and not include, but we have our CRFs that we can also share with you. A venous blood sample, pharyngeal swabs, and urine sample from, old, from younger kids and those who have symptoms. We are doing on-site laboratory tests, so for every single person, any age, inpatient, outpatient, Malaria testing with a PLDH and HRP2-based combo test, and also microscopy. Blood culture and susceptibility. We've had to implement that at many of our sites with Bactech or Vitec machines. We're doing HIV at the African sites only, not because we think only Africans have HIV, but because our Asian sites, for political reasons, refused to test for HIV. Mycobacterial blood culture in African adults only because we can only get the volume from grown people and that's where the HIV prevalence justifies it. And then urine dipstick and culture for tiny kids under two and older patients with symptoms of urinary tract infection. The clinical management, this is not a clinical or intervention study, so all of the clinical management is being done by routine staff locally. We give advice if we can, but otherwise it's handled routinely. The results of the on-site tests are provided to the staff as soon as they're available, including culture results. Patients are followed up after 28 days for further blood sample for the serology, convalescent serology, and also the clinical outcome. Very simple questionnaire about better, worse, same. To estimate the background prevalence, as I mentioned, we're doing a, a healthcare utilization survey in community controls. That's 600 per site. We're only, unfortunately, matching one to four for reasons I'm happy to describe. It's not our choice. It's sort of logistics. We are doing a very healthy component of qualitative and social science work in ethnography with Claire Chandler's group. And then, as I mentioned, we're having a, we are storing a sample repository, which is serum, plasma, a red cell pellet, some filter paper samples, and um, nasopharyngeal swabs for future use by people who present and request through a very careful, transparent, independent um, decision-making process. Just a few pictures. This is one of our Zimbabwe, our Malawian study nurses practicing getting a nasopharyngeal swab from uh, one of our Zimbabwean nurses. I just showed this has been a huge amount of, and a very lot of fun for training and interaction and so forth. This is our Lao team. Some of you will recognize some people there. This is a, uh, um, <coughs> Mr. Christophe, one of the senior lab techs in Mozambique, doing a buffy coat. This is what our samples look like. That's 
from the right to the left, that's a couple tubes of serum, um, red cell, uh, whole blood rather, um, buffy coat, plasma, and the red cell pellet. So this is what we store for every single participant, as much as we can get out of them within our ethics volumes. This is the community healthcare survey happening in, or the, a home visit with uh, the healthcare utilization survey happening in Mozambique. And, this, and then some reference lab testing. So a lot of this we can't do at site. A lot of the things we want to look for, just briefly. So the bloodstream infections, we're doing culture and susceptibility testing at each site and then sending any isolates, including possible contaminants, off to as far away as we can probably, possibly send them to New Zealand, of all places, a reference laboratory for Malditoff confirmation. We are doing the same thing with mycobacteria from bloodstream infections in Germany. We are sending blood smears to the Liverpool School for malaria, non-malaria blood parasites, and borreliosis. The only way you can accurately diagnose Laos-born relapsing, tick-born relapsing, borreliosis species, which are actually quite common in Africa, is with a blood smear. So we're hoping that we can get decent diagnostics on that. I keep going. I keep going. Okay. This is Audrey can tell us more about this. Audrey here is uh, doing a wonderful job, very communicative, very helpful from the from Marseille, the French National Center. Chikungunya, dengue, Japanese, Zika, yellow fever, West Nile, and Yong Yong. We've got some very complicated algorithms for this. Um, we are doing in Australia and Moru rickettsia testing, Q fever, scrub typhus, spotted fever, typhus group with serologies. IFA is in serology. We are doing a brucella up in Liverpool also. We've just recently, I haven't updated this slide, we just recently got approval to do this in Liverpool. Um, we hope that Queensland will help us out. We're still waiting to confirm where we're going to do our lepto serologies. We've tried to pick only internationally recognized centers of excellence that peer reviewers cannot say we're not confident in your lab results. And at the London School, we're doing leishmaniasis testing with, under supervision from Peter Chiadini and um, with DAT assays from Petra Menz. Miravista, another commercial laboratory in the UK, is do, sorry, this is in the Indiana. Uh, this is Joe Wheat's lab doing histo serology and some EQA for crypto. We just recently switched to doing CRAG point of care tests for crypto. And then Micropathology Commercial Lab in the UK is going to process our nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs for respiratory viruses. So a lot of work, a huge amount of money, but we hope gold standard. Don't want to ever have to repeat it again, but this should be gold standard diagnostics with nice, rigorous clinical background information that we should be able to say internationally accepted case definitions. This is what we think these people are suffering from, their fever. Biomarkers, a quick table that I ripped off from Yol. He can tell us more about this, and Kevin may also. <clears throat> I was asked to put this in. So this is, I don't know if everybody has heard of this. This is a Febridex um, point-of-care test. This is, as far as I'm aware, the only commercially available fever point-of-care test as of at least uh, early 2018. There's a few others in the pipeline, as some of you here know much better than I do. This one is CE marked. It's licensed for clinical use in Canada. It detects both CRP, C-reactive protein, which I think most of us are quite familiar with, and MIX-A, mixovirus resistance protein A, which is something that your body does uh, in response to viral infections, to distinguish bacterial versus viral versus no infection. Requires fresh, whole blood. You can't do this after the fact. You have to do it near the, pa near the, near the point of care, near the patient. You can't do it with archived blood. And all the published clinical studies thus far are from US medical centers and all are designed and funded by RPS, who are the test designers. And you can see it's a lateral flow assay. It has a semi-quantitative assessment of CRP and then mix A in those, two, in those two test panels over there, drop of blood, and we can take another look at that. I just, I slotted this in because people were asking over lunch. Folks haven't heard of it. I think we should be aware of this. We should be trying to evaluate this in LMIC settings because people are going to start using it, and I want to know how well it works before they start using it on, on patients. Um, outside the U.S. The U.S. in a hospital setting is very different to a rural clinic in Thailand or Laos or Uganda. Expected outcomes of the fever study, just to recap, standardized fever etiology data in and out patients of all ages at representative sites, antimicrobial susceptibility data to help guide treatment recommendations when we do identify bacterial infections, a library or archive or repository of well-characterized samples, yeah. which we can use to evaluate biomarkers and diagnostics, Insights into the acceptability of alternative diagnostic processes. This is social science. This is how well are people going to be willing to take up new diagnostics, new algorithms, new approaches. Uh, 
And then baseline data, again, which we hope we can use in the improvement and development of algorithms and strategies, not just tools, but strategies for patient management. We're also doing a, side studies, subprojects. We're missing, I think, a lot of One Health and environmental and um, veterinary linkages, so I'd be happy to discuss some of those. We are doing some transcriptomics. Um, uh, with Paul Newton, we'd be, we'd be very happy to take an opportunity to look more at antibiotic quality. We, of course, are thinking of this as phase one. We want to do phase two, phase three, new studies that are intervention studies, not just repeat fever studies, as, um, as Blaise mentioned this morning. We're not just trying to repeat descriptions. We're trying to do something about this and treat patients more appropriately. Okay, now I shut up. Thank you. Is there any questions, burning questions? We are kind of, we did start a bit late, so we sort of are a bit 25 minutes behind schedule, but if everyone's okay with a late coffee break. <laughs> this one, maybe I missed it. Um, uh, are you also recording the clinical outcomes and the treatments which these people will be receiving? 